Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up today with a special selection which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. This one comes at us from John, main songwriter of Broder Daniel taken from his solo debut album released in 2017. Now this is a Swedish person I believe and I'm terrible with Swedish pronunciations. But I believe his name is Hendrik Berdegren. Something like that. I think the first name I'm pretty good with. The second name, though, there's two R's in it. And the Swedish R, I have such a problem with. I'm just going to keep calling him Hendrik, though, because I'm pretty sure I got that first name pretty good. Um, like I mentioned, uh, this was the lead singer of Brother Daniel or Broder Daniel, and uh, this is their solo album it's called Wolf's Heart. Let's dive into it, Let's see what they're bringing to the table with parties. It came out in 2017, as John had mentioned. Get your kicks and hit the ritz, the world is full. Nice little three four here. All the Caesars ruled the pie, and the chairman ate his tie. Now I'm gonna die. The little slide whistle over here on the left. I like the uh, glockenspiel, is it? Might just be a keyboard. <laughs> the little spring. We got a piano this time around to take this interlude melody. Although the glockenspiel still ornamenting over. This is such a fun song. Philistine Grand Smuggery, bigoted arch bigotry. Nothing's new in history. Nero may have killed his mom. So the vocals continue to emphasize three and one. For his heart, but he sure could throw a ball. Here's to the party. There'll be the end of me. Let's go. Fun little synthy stuff over here. Oh, okay. It just, I mean, it's a fine ending. It's just, uh, a bit unceremonious, it just sort of happens. Uh, so yeah, the whole song, I mean, this actually is a really cool way to cap off minimalistic uh, composition. There's a lot of maximalistic ideas in here when we take into account all of the ornamental flourish going on, but the core idea 
doesn't really change at all. We have an A section throughout this whole thing. Reminds me a lot of uh, folk music. Kind of focusing on one specific idea and allowing the lyrics to take precedence as everything else is rather static. And so what we have here is something that's kind of waltzy in some ways and not in others. We do have a lower instrument emphasizing beat one. Boom, 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 boom. Very waltzy in that manner. However, the lead melody doesn't emphasize one as, as, prom as predominantly over everything else because there is a strong emphasis of three also in the lead melody. So we have this bum 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 one two three one two three one two three one two that's how a lot of the melody is built up through the vocals occasionally that three is dismissed in order to have a little bit of a hanging element before coming back in strong on the one but we do see that a lot of the movements in the vocals tends to emphasize around that rhythmic flow that is not very waltzy uh, regardless, though, because we have this sometimes emphasis on three, heavy emphasis on one, it does create a very nice flowy element to it, and it is something that's very easy to move your body to in some manner or another, uh, whether you're just bobbing your head or, any, or you know moving your whole body. Uh, that rhythm shines through uh, and just works so well. Everything else is sort of designed to augment around that. And a lot of that comes through flourish, ornamentation, uh, ways to punctuate ideas. We might do eight bars of this, uh, this steady 3-4 idea with the melody on top, and then the vocals will qu quit out after that seventh bar. And the eighth bar will be empty. Um, and then we'll have one of the flurry of sounds that are present springs or glockenspiels or laughter or any number of things um, that kind of pop up and will fill in that space at the end of a phrase as a sort of punctuation to end the phrase and allow us to repeat back at the beginning but have a point of finality within the loop itself and so when you mix that with the very flowy nature of everything, to me it comes off as very fun. Now, I don't know if fun is really the right word for it. There's a dreariness, I think, overall harmonically, but because of the energy that the song kind of gives with the rhythmic pattern and the groove, it feels a bit more bouncy and optimistic because of that. There's this clash there, I think. Now, vocally, I think the notes that he chooses and his vocal delivery pushes forward the idea of the dreariness, uh, the lethargy that uh, embodies more of the harmonic side of this. But then you have springs and laughter and the brightness of a glockenspiel showing up. Uh, and that kind of pushes more towards the positivity of the song. And so there is this clash here. Is this song dreary is it solemn is it heavy or is it light and optimistic and colorful and it's it's both in equal measure depending on what you're listening to and i find that to be fascinating just within itself i i'm curious what the lyrics are going to be about uh, i'm hoping there's some sort of division or dichotomy that we're going to find in there but on the whole i, I didn't really know how to feel while listening to this because it's both it kind of wanted me to feel a bit heavier and, and weighed down but there's so many elements that are just fun and i think i even said at one point this is just a fun song and it, it isn't just that but i think that's what most people are going to lean into because it is what's on the surface it's where the groove is at the end of every eight bars or so you're getting something a bit obtuse wacky even there's a circusy feel to some of this i think it's really easy to ignore uh the atmosphere of it at least on a first time listen and just kind of go with the flow of the the zany ideas <laughs> the the fun elements to it and uh maybe that's what it's about
a darkness under the brightness. So some sort of, uh, you know, something negative that sits just below the surface that's there. If you're looking, it's obvious, but it's easy to dismiss it as well, uh, to look past it at times and just take in that surface level idea. Um, there are some interludes in here, and I don't quite know how to feel about them yet either. I like how they break things up. If we look at the vocal parts as an A section, these interludes are a nice B section that while the foundation doesn't change, the melody itself, the timbre that presents the melody does. It creates some level of contrast in the song, allowing us to divide up sections of the track rather than it just being one long on one long run on uh, vocal part that exists on top of everything. Um, and we get glockenspiel here. We get piano here. We had a, I couldn't tell if it was a tuba or a baritone there. Uh, either way, it's a lower end brass instrument that was valve based, not slide based, so not a trombone. Uh, if it was a trombone, it was very, very precise. But I feel like a trombone also has a brighter timbre than this did. This was warmer. So I'm going to go with baritone or even a tuba. Um, and a baritone is kind of just a small tuba. The timbre is very similar. The range is just different. It's got a little bit more upper end to it. Um, but yeah, so we had those three instruments that come in and I think they presented three different melody lines on top of the song. Mm, can't remember anymore, but uh, it was just a nice way to break out of what we we're already doing and continue to break out of it. If we had just done vocals, piano, vocals, piano, vocals, piano, that's, that's a pattern, but this is vocals, an instrument, vocals, a different instrument. And this allows at least on a sonic level to create more contrast with each of these. If the purpose of the interlude is to break up the monotony, we need to break up the monotony of the pattern of bringing up interludes too. So we do something fresh on all of them. And I appreciated that. I don't necessarily know that they changed too much about the song in a way that having them altered my understanding of what the song was attempting to accomplish, but it's contrast. And as I've mentioned so many times over the past few years, contrast is one of the most powerful tools a composer has. Even for songs that are designed to be static, something like this, or even like a post-rock song or an, an entirely atmospheric track, if you do like seven minutes of atmosphere and then you come in with something different, that's going to be really impactful. That's the power of contrast, even in songs that aren't aiming for a lot of diversity in sound. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed the contrast on this, not just in the composition, but in the sound profile of it all as well. Now, speaking of the sound profile, there are some really cool instruments in here, too. Uh, it's interesting given that uh, Broder Daniel is a rock outfit, I think. We checked out one song of theirs on a full reaction. I think we did one on a live stream, too. Um, but regardless, I kind of have them pegged down as like a, a radio rock kind of thing. Alternative rock, maybe. And uh, this was very much not that. This is folk, I think, at the base of it, but instrumentally, it's all over the place. And I really love that. There's a lot of cool timbres in here that while I kind of grazed past the composition of it and focused primarily on what was written rather than what played it, there are so many cool sounds that come through the composition to play what was written. Um, and it's what gives it its vibe as well. Many of the instruments tend to be a bit warmer. They tend to be a bit darker. And that really helps sell the mood of this track. Uh, but I also don't think we heard any guitars. And there's no percussion in here? I mean, there were a lot of layers. I wasn't looking for percussion ever. But I, also, I don't remember any percussion. Even like on the fringe of my memory. So yeah. A lot of things were accomplished with a lot of non-traditional instruments. And I mean, 
I keep coming back to it, but that spring was very left field and I absolutely loved it. Uh, and I enjoyed that it came back a second time. A lot of the ornamentation will uh, continue to evolve much like the interludes did always bringing up a new instrument or a new thing at one point like I mentioned we had that really hearty laugh come through to to fill the space between verses but the spring came up twice and I, I like that it's eccentric but double eccentric because it's the only one that breaks the mold of all the instruments to say actually I want this one to come up again it was the spring and not like the piano or anything. Let me have some lyrics on this, see what's going on, and then we're going to wrap this one up. You know what's interesting here is I'm getting a bit of a uh, like fairy tale vibe. And part of that, I think, is just going to be the general rhythm of it. Because of that flow I was talking about, the emphasis on one and three, even through poetry, it kind of feels like that. I don't think... I think that even if I hadn't heard the song, I still might have found this rhythm in the lyrics. Right off the bat, get your kicks and hit the Ritz. The world is full of hypocrites. It just works so well. Um, and I mean, part of it might also be because I'm a parent and I read a lot of Dr. Seuss and Dr. Seuss has a lot of this rhythmic scheme in it. Um, or at least I found it in the in the poetry of Dr. Seuss. So maybe I'm just used to finding this, uh, you know, simple, fun, bouncy rhythm in places. But it just it like it it screams out at me just from the text that this is probably how it should go. I'm curious if I would have found that. I'm confident I would have, but you know, now I can never know honestly, <laughs> which is. Uh, Kind of sucks about stuff like that. I wish you could go back in time, erase the memory or something. I don't know how that would work. Pull an eternal sunshine just so I could put this uh, hypothesis to the test. Oh man, what an abuse of technology that would be. An abuse of the, the body. Anyways, getting way off topic. It's about going to parties. And about parties not being fantastic. The chorus changes every time. The first one says, here's to the parties, will be the end of me, but my time is waning, so I'll go out blazing. Uh, you know, so parties are wrecking me physically, maybe even mentally, but might as well go out on a high note than, you know, <laughs> to live a life of comfort till the end. The second time says, here's to the parties, they'll be the end of me, I'm going to hell, but I do it well. So the parties themselves include things that are kind of frowned upon by uh, the religion but I do it well the final one says here's to the parties they'll be the end of me let's go down together nothing is forever dancing on the precipice surfing the waves of the abyss so the idea is that what's done at these parties uh, is usually not something that's on the up and up. Maybe culturally, maybe socially, maybe legally, maybe spiritually. But it's how you get things done. And it's how you get things done, particularly if you don't want to be seen as a prude or a boring person or a square. We're going to use some older lingo. <laughs> um life doesn't last forever anyways so why try to extend it out let's just do all this stuff anyways how did water jump out of my cup at me uh, but then we have the verses and this is where things get a little wilder for me because I don't understand all of the metaphors and how they're connected and uh, particularly, I think, more than metaphors, there are a couple, but allusions to things. So the first one says, get your kicks and hit the Ritz. The world is full of hypocrites. So go have fun at the parties. Meet all the people who lie through their teeth, right? And then it says, bobbly do bang, gobbly gook. I really love this because I don't know what it means and it feels like he's just filling space but like there's a part of me that's like no this is important we just got done talking about hypocrites who say things that don't mean anything because they don't mean what they're saying and then we have baby talk 
And I haven't quite figured out the connection there, but I like it. Uh, then he says, all the Caesars rule the pie, and the chairman ate his tie, now I'm going to die. And this is where things start to feel a little bit like um, gong for me. Where there there is some meaning to the words themselves, but also the sound of the words is equally as important to why they were utilized. I kind of get the idea of Caesars ruling the pie. All of the Caesars, not just one. Every ruler out there is a Caesar and they rule the pie. What's up with the chairman eating his tie and why does that make this person die? Other than that, it's a good rhyme. Follows the rhythmic scheme. I don't know. Then we get to verse 2. Herod thrived. Well, Jesus died. Cortez got rich and Schubert poor. Sobriety is such a bore. Home of Virgil and Donald Duck, and Napoleon lost his sock. Come on, let's rock around the clock, and tell me you're not feeling a Dr. Seuss vibe from this now, too. All of these are well-known people throughout history, which I assume is maybe what the parties are about. At a certain level of import, parties become less about the party and more about mingling with people who can help your career or your popularity or whatever you're trying to get out of it. Putting a bunch of popular people in the same room is what these parties are really about, to get people talking, to make connections, uh, to get to know the right people, to do what you need to do. But aside from that, I don't really get all of it. And I think most of it is why are these specific names chosen and what do they have to do with the names around them? Why bring up specifically Herod and Jesus and their oppositions of one living and one dying? Uh, you know, we also have the parallel of Cortez and Schubert, one being rich, one being poor. And in the, in the middle of naming all these people, it says sobriety is such a bore, which of course parties have a lot of drinking to do with them. Uh, usually not like a college party where the purpose is to get drunk usually i would assume that richer parties are about wine and class you're not supposed to get blackout drunk but i'm sure people do after all nothing is forever so uh let's go down together so i mean verse three kind of goes in the same area talks about bigots and philistine uh nero burning rome uh, but I think one thing I really like in this last verse, he says, Nero may have killed his mom and burned Rome for his hall, but he sure could throw a ball. And this reminds me about how the rich and famous are able to work around simple things like laws or even image just by throwing their money around. Yeah, Nero might have done some bad stuff, but bro, have you seen his parties? Public opinion can change because of something like that. So I, I get the gist of all of this. Maybe the point is that we should party to get our minds off of the fact that all these rich and famous people are uh, in a completely different life than us, a, a different difficulty setting, so to speak. It, it juxtaposes all of these people doing what they do with the fact that we really don't have much and why why delay the inevitable anyways? We might as well have fun while we're here because we certainly aren't going to live the same life they are. That's kind of the vibe I get from it, but I don't know. I feel like I'm missing a piece because I feel like, at least for me, that's a very weak connection here. And what does all this have to do with the music? And again, I'm kind of empty-handed there. These are not necessarily the, necessarily the lyrics I thought we were going to have. Oh, snap! The song is about the dread of knowing that you can't change what rich people are going to do. So just party and live your life the best you can with the time you have. The dread and sorrow versus the high and ecstasy of partying. Dread. Dance. That's what I talked about earlier with atmosphere versus, you know, feeling and tone and timbre and stuff. Yeah, 
Okay, that that works out for me. I, I'm a I'm a bit stronger in my confidence on my read here. But I mean, as usual, those are just my thoughts on Hendedik's parties. What are yours? Do you agree with what I came to in my conclusion? Anything I talked about? Do you want to correct me on something I said? Maybe you just want to tell me your own thoughts, opinions, and perspectives on it. Put all that stuff down in the comments. Above that, in the description box, there's a link for a link tree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. We're going to check out an album. Uh, it's... Uh, Flesh God Apocalypse, Valeno, I think, Valeno, something like that. That's going to be intense. Um, I'm half looking forward to that, I think. Um, it, it's intense, but I like the composition, so that'll be fun. Uh, also, we have the live stream Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, morning for me anyways. Uh, and if none of that interests you and you're just here for traditional reactions, I'll be back Monday. We're going to go forward with next week's theme. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.